um, the first business to attend to is just to turn it right over to staff. And Gene Gatza, our moderator, is going to handle the protocols for tonight's virtual meeting. Gene. Great, thanks, Arm. Pull this up real quick. Take your time. Share. Okay. Very good, everybody. Welcome to the planning board meeting. Um, we just have a couple things to go over real quick. Um, we are aiming to keep these meetings respectful and orderly, and therefore we have a few um, items of protocol to go through. So any activities that delay, disrupt, or interfere with the meeting are prohibited. Um, just as if we were meeting in person, the time for speaking or asking questions is limited, and either I or Harmon will recognize um, applicants and members of the public to speak, and then we will unmute you. Um, we need everyone that is, who is um, looking to address the board to please um, enter your full name. If your full name is not currently displayed, um, please change it or you can send it to me in the chat and I'm happy to change it for you. Um, all public comment is by video, is by um, voice only. So no video will be permitted except for the board, staff and applicants. Um, and let's see, uh, either Harmon or I or Cindy, if she's the acting host, will in, in enforce these rules by muting anyone who violates the rules. And the um, chat function, as well as the Q&A, um, I think uh, uh, we are not trying to use the Q&A tonight. Um, it is very specifically not for questions and answers, um, particularly related to any of the content that the board is addressing. The chat function should only be used for technical issues to communicate with me or Cindy as the host. Um, and we will work to enforce that. Um, we, the chat function really should not be a method of discussion amongst board members or amongst um, members of the community or applicants. Um, and that is, those are our rules. Um, for the public hearing, so we'll have an open comment first for um, if folks would like to address the board on topics that are not uh, public hearing tonight. And, um, and then I think we, have, we also have a public hearing um, for this item. I'll let you guys address that part. Um, are we seeing a raise hand function? I'm not sure we have that. So um, if folks would like to speak, please message me in the chat. Um, we may have some in the Q&A um, when we get to either the open comment or the public hearing. And um, I will, I will um, acknowledge those and call on folks that have indicated that they would like to provide testimony. Um, let's see, we'll tee up several speakers at once. Each speaker will have three minutes to address the board. Um, and I'm, ga I'm gonna be able to leave the screen on where we can see each other during the um, public comment. So I will do the timer and I will use some of these. So please be watching um, for a 30 second warning and a time's up um, when we get to that public hearing. And let's see, back to the please for a full name if you would like to address the board. Um, and I think that's it. Thanks, everyone. Cindy, did I miss anything, Harmon? Nope. nope. Thanks, Jean. Appreciate that. Um, so generally, the next order of business would be approval of minutes, but we had three sets of minutes last week and none this week. So we're going to move on after I call on Sarah to public participation. Sarah? So first, Lupita is here, but she's not visible. And secondly, uh -huh. I, don't think we act, I don't think we gaveled in the meeting, just FYI. I didn't hit anything, but I called oh. us. Later. Oh, you did? Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. That's all. Yeah, I, pr I promoted Lupita, but Jean, while she was talking, she just needs to, I was wait till Jean's done, she needs to promote her, so. Yeah. Okay. Or she, yeah. okay. Um, oh, Lupita. Yeah, so Lisa? Are we still doing census reminders? Oh, that's a great idea, because I think that this may be one of the last uh, meetings where we can do a census reminder. Um, I think the deadline, of, uh, Charles, was the deadline going to be October 1st or has that been extended? 
No, as far as I know, it's still uh, end of this month. Okay. So then I'm going to make a public service announcement on behalf of the City of Boulder and Planning Board that anybody who has not filled out their census forms, please do so. It is very important for the representation of the City of Boulder and the State of Colorado and the accuracy of the United States Census for everyone to fill out their census forms. It's safe and it's easy and it only takes a few minutes. So please do your part as a citizen and perform your constitutional decennial duty and fill out the census. Besides, you can only do it as an adult, so there are only a certain number of times that you can do it in your lifetime. Make this one count. Okay, number three, public participation. This is um, for any member of the public to address us on any Ill issue that is relevant to the planning board, but does not include the public hearing that we have tonight, which is on the Macy's project, uh, or more specifically a site review amendment to the 29th Street Shopping Center at 1928th Street. Uh, if you're wanting to discuss that with planning board, then you'll wait till public comment after that public hearing item for any other matter. Um, now's your chance, three minutes. I'm going to turn it back over to Jean. And Jean, if you don't mind being the, uh, the ombudsman to run this matter, that would be great. OK. Um, yeah, I'm not sure why we don't have a raised hand function. I thought we did. So um, I do see Lynn Siegel. Um, and um, OK, and Beth. Ondorf. So um, I'm sorry. We're okay. Take your time. Using with the controls. Um, I'm not sure whether Lynn or um, Beth would like to speak in the open comment or um, for the Macy's items. So I will. We'll just. We'll just find out. So Lynn, you can go first, and then, um, and then Beth. So. Let's see. And I think Lupita's got her hand up for a second. Give, give her a chance to speak. Yes, I was just checking on the, on the participants panel. Um, there is a place to say, um, to raise your hand. It's not like usually is with a little button. It's more under the button that says more. If you click that, there will be an option for raise hand in the drop down menu. So it is, there's, it is somewhere, it just takes more steps than usual. For some reason, I don't know why. Thank you, Lupita. I appreciate that. I, I think that what I'm seeing is different than what the attendees see. So thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. Um, so I just did it. I just clicked on it and it's got a check, a check mark next to raised hand for in my drop down menu, but I don't see a hand up next to my name in the participants menu. So I'm not sure it worked. I don't have a participants menu. It's under participants, then you click QA, then it's raise hand on the right. Okay, that's, uh, that's how um, attendees, we're in, the, we're in this um, webinar mode. So- Raise hand, there you put it there. There we go, board members and staff are panelists and co-hosts and attendees are different. So we're all seeing it just a little bit differently. So thanks for bearing with us with that. Okay, Lynn. Yeah, I wish that you would, I wish that you would get this all coordinated between the different boards and the council and all the different meetings that go on with city government because half the time is spent just coordinating this stuff and going through your disclaimers. Don't do the disclaimers, that's a waste of time. Just put them on the website, refer people to them because this is just like a live meeting. You don't do all those disclaimers in a live meeting. You don't intimidate people. The way, it, and it's very intimidating. I don't want to hear that stuff. I'm coming here to speak to give my precious time. And you intimidate me first, with, that I'm going to be some terrorist saying the wrong thing. No, that needs to go on the website. You refer anyone who's speaking to go to the website. It's pretty simple. And this has been seven months now. And you people have not gotten it together yet. And it's time to figure out this is a real virus. It's here to friggin' stay. And you've got to deal with it. And I don't like not seeing myself or you not seeing me. That's not okay. I am the public. 
I am the one you are responsible to. And you won't even look at me. That's horrific. That's unspeakable. And that's not okay. And you should make it clear to the council and clear to Tom Carr that it's not okay. And people have spoken up. I've heard this at meeting and meeting and meeting and meeting. And you don't get anyone to come and speak at your meetings. And I'll tell you why. This is why. Because they're turned away. I'm the stupidest one to come and try to speak. Because I care enough to somehow change this thing. And that's why I'm speaking here. There's plenty of things I want to talk about. How you should stop putting third stories and subsidizing them. That's not okay. That's what I want to talk about, the substance. Instead, I have to talk about getting a frigging video window up. That is unspeakable. Not okay. Do you hear me? You never hear. You don't want to hear. And your public doesn't want to hear anymore either. And they don't want to bother to even come to these meetings. And they're not in any way going to be more engaged by this process. Believe me. Now, is my three minutes up and then you can have Beth? <laughs> I don't know. The big three minute sign isn't in my face. 30 seconds. 30, 30 seconds. Thank you. Stop spinning your wheels answer some of my emails that I send you every single meeting and I'm very specific in my emails and I ask questions in my emails and I'm not just to be disregarded. I'm a human being. I have concerns in this community and I bring them forward and I never hear a response from you. Never. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah. Okay, so do I understand that um, Ms. Hondorf is there with you? Yes, I'm here. Her name's Beth. Hi, Jean. Hi, Beth. How are you? Good. It's hard for me to speak on this virtual stuff, I'm, but I really appreciate that you all are there listening to me. Um, I'm in this ADU process, and I'm just really upset about it. The whole thing started, you know, one night, months ago, I made some statements about racism and stuff when that whole Mirabelle thing came about. And um, the next day there were like three code enforcement people banging to come in my house and search. And I said, I'm, you're not getting in without a search warrant. And so this, I called my lawyer and then this proceeded on and then I got one thing straightened out at planning and then I ended up in the ADU because originally they had told me there were no ADUs left. So I had to apply for a different kind of a permit and um, because they were mistaken about their map and they collected like 500 bucks for me. And then when I pointed out that they were mistaken, they said, oh, well then you can get an ADU. There is one left because we counted one twice. So then I went through the ADU permit, which costs more money and they, they won't reimburse the original uh, fee. But what troubles me most about this is that I've got the last ADU in my neighborhood and it's created a nightmare of animosity. Other people want an ADU. My neighbors have said, oh, she's, she's uh, turning it all into multifamily. She has an Asian and a Mexican living in her place. It, it, it is just horrible. And so, in fact, I had to file an elder at risk complaint this week. And so it's just escalating. And what I'm wondering, I, I live in the neighborhood adjacent to Lynn and she's got like four left in hers. Can we borrow ADUs from another neighborhood so that the last person in doesn't get treated like this? And, um, or else can you grant some more ADUs in the neighborhoods that have, uh, have them? You know, I've, I've provided affordable housing and uh, minority housing my whole life from the time my parents raised me in Cincinnati. And so um, this process is, is not doing, it's not working right, you know? And so, um, and the other thing is the three person per house, even if you have an ADU, the numbers don't work. Does it make sense to go out and spend 50 grand on ADU if you can only have a density of three people in your house? And the fact about our neighborhood, which I've talked to Jean about before, is that our neighborhood is skewed because we have such a high abortion rate there over the last 50 years. 
and because of the way society is evolving, um, there's just not this family structure. You know, we make our own families and maybe you're not blood related, but you do love each other as brother and sister. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. Okay, I, we have gotten a number of messages that the raise hand function is not easy and keeps coming and going. So um, if there is anyone else who would like to speak in open comment, please shoot me a quick message in the chat. Um, you can also let me know that you would like to be teed up to speak um, in the public hearing and um, the item coming up um, a little bit later on and then I'll tee you up for that. Yeah, no one else is, is waiting at my place anyway. And I'm sure that no one else, no one else is going to sign up because of your obstructive processes. Thanks, Lynn. All right, I am seeing no one else under open comment. Hey, thanks, Jean. And we'll uh, end the public participation and move on to discussions of dispositions, planning okay. board call-ups and continuations. The first item is a call-up item. It's a use review for a medical laboratory office for your analysis, 2850 Iris Avenue, Suite North, medical laboratory use at Diagonal Plaza. This decision may be called up before planning board on or before September 25th, tomorrow, 2020. Is there anyone from planning board with any questions, comments, or a call-up request on item 4A? Okay, we'll move on to 4B, second call-up item of the night. It's a site review for 5250 Manhattan Circle, minor site review amendment to permit a remodel of an existing retail building into a dental office, subject to a 1977 planned unit development P77. The scope of the project includes two additions of 450 square feet on the northwest corner and south side of the building. Total square footage of the building would be 3,399 square feet. This decision may be called up before planning board on or before October 2nd, 2020. And you'll note this one is, is on our agenda tonight, even though we have an October 1st meeting on the calendar because that meeting's been canceled. So this one was able to be added to our agenda for tonight. Thank you to staff. Is there anyone who wants to ask any questions, make comments, or call up this site review? Okay. Then we're going to move on to the public hearing item of the night. It's item 5A on your agenda. It's called uh, public hearing and consideration of a site review amendment to the 29th Street Shopping Center to adaptively reuse and redesign the existing Macy's Department Store located at 1928th Street in the Business Regional 1, BR1 Zoning District as an office and retail building reviewed under case number LUR 2018-0075. The proposal requires review by planning board because it includes a modification to the principal building height and the applicant has requested vested rights. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to our uh, esteemed Charles Farrow from Planning and Development Services. And Charles, you can take it from here. Great. Thanks very much. Good evening, members of the board. Elaine McLaughlin is going to present staff's analysis tonight. Great. Thanks, Charles. And good evening, everybody. I'm going to just uh, get this thing rolling here. And um, Clean up my screen a bit. So um, as, um, as Harmon mentioned, um, this is for a site review amendment to 29th Street. And I'm just going to give you a quick overview of um, our discussion this evening or staff's presentation. Um, so we'll go over the review process and the context, including the policy and built context over time. And then we'll review the proposal followed by key issues. So the site review amendments for the request to modify height under Appendix J of the code uh, for the principal and accessory buildings and the hearing requirements for the vested rights. Note that uh, there were code changes that occurred after application was made that 
don't apply to this application, including changes related to the opportunity zones uh, and related to provision of community benefits. So therefore, the app applicable um, standards um, for the proposal include site review criteria, guidelines, and BBCP policies. So the site's located within the Boulder Valley Regional Center, BBRC, and it's been identified for decades as in the comprehensive plan as one of three regional centers defined as forming a triangle at Boulder's geographic center and which provide a range of activities that draw from the entire city as well as the region. The site is centrally located in the BBRC and it's adjacent to Boulder Junction. And uh, Boulder Junction, as we all know, is both a regional transportation hub as well as a growing mixed use area with about 1400 residential units that have been built in the last um, five to 10 years, um, including some that are nearing completion. So it's essentially a new urban neighborhood that's happening next door. Um, and the comprehensive plan defines the BVRC as primarily a commercial area providing retail and range of scales, restaurants, offices, hotels, and the geographic center of Boulder. So within the BVRC, the site's part of 29th Street Mall that was approved as a site re review amendment in the mid 2000s. Um, and it was for redevelopment of what had been the former Crossroads Mall. And this is actually pretty helpful to understand how this area has changed over time. Um, it was built in the 1960s and was there until the early 2000s. Large enclosed mall that included retailers such as Montgomery Wards, JC Penney's, the Denver Dry Goods, and Made F that you can see up where the subject building stands today in red. In essence, it was a single use zoning and auto oriented mall. So with the site review amendment, uh, the 29th Street Mall became an outdoor mall that was configured around a main street core with a mix of uses that include everything from Home Depot to the Century Boulder Movie Theater, a number of small retailers, restaurants and offices, and there's fitness and athletic clubs, all totaling about 877,000 square feet. So at the time that the 29th Street Plan was approved, a set of design guidelines were also adopted and of course, the intent of the guidelines is to oversee redevelopment and to um, ensure that um, it's in keeping with the goals of the BVRC to ensure vitality and pedestrian orientation. So the 29th Street Mall also became a transit rich hub over time and now it hosts a number of buses, local buses, um, including the Hop, the Bound, the 205, the Bolt, um, and the Flatiron Flyer. And uh, with close proximity about a quarter mile away to the regional Boulder Junction Transit Facility to the north um, and moving through what will be the REV development you see in the lower left there, um, fairly easy access from uh, multi-use paths. And so the 29th Street Mall re uh, redevelopment plans retain that existing department store from Crossroads Mall, as I noted, formerly Median F and Foley's and then most recently, of course, Macy's. And um, the existing buildings, approximately 151,000 square feet on two levels. There's a large loading dock on the northwest or northeast corner rather. And the Macy's building and the site are separately owned from the rest of 29th Street. Then in the surrounding context, the 29 North apartments are adjacent to the north along with Target. Um, there's a two-story parking structure serving the mall to the east along with the Colorado Athletic Club. And then there's those inline shops with office on the east side on the second story and then smaller pad commercial sites to the west. And then in terms of multimodal connections, there's an on-street bike lane within 29th as well as 30th and Walnut Streets and multi-use paths north of Walnut along 30th with that underpass that connects up and into that upcoming uh, REV development. And then of course to and through Boulder Junction. So the comp plan designates the property as mixed use business land use and office and retail fall under the definition for the uses. And then the property zoned BR1, business regional one, which at the time of the application submittal allowed office and retail uses by right. Under recent code changes today, office uses over 20,000 square feet are subject to use review. 
For the proposed project, the applicant intends to adaptively reuse the existing Macy's building with a retrofit as office and retail. Um, and you'll see a third story addition on that west side um, that reads as two stories, but with the new low, lower level plaza daylight to the existing basement, um, it essentially becomes three stories. Uh, the building is going to add light wells at the center of the building, a third story deck, and as you can see, it's going to open up the entire west side to windows. Take what is a blank facade and open it up to transparency. On the southwest side of the building, the applicant's proposing to remove the existing covered um, exterior escalator and add windows and retail space. They've referred to it as the marketplace adjacent to the plaza. And where there's plans in the plaza to upgrade with benches, planters, community design, um, dining uh, tables, along with a wood trellis at a 15 foot height, um, but it equates to 32 feet when it's measured from that low point. So in summary, it's a total of about 155,000 square feet of office, about 7,700 square feet of retail, and that works out to be a net addition of 11,746 square feet, and that's um, all told about a 1.59 FAR, where 2.0 is standard, and you can actually do up to 4.0 um, FAR through review in the BR1 zoning. And then uh, at the lower right, you can see um, that um, the applicant's also proposing 230 bike parking spaces where 115 are required and those are split uh, between long-term and short-term. So jumping into key issue one, um, staff found the proposal to be consistent with a number of BBCP policies. We'll just highlight a few this evening. Um, the adaptive reuse of the building, of course, addresses the city's policy for compact development and the revitalization of the building uh, response to uh, 2.17 variety of centers um, where it's noted a variety of activities are expected, such as working, shopping, et cetera, with regional centers located near transit and the planned office and retail uses in the transit rich area, of course, meet this policy. Regarding policy 2.18 for the BVRC, the proposal to reuse the existing office building and diversify that mix of uses in 29th Street with office is consistent with the city's goals to maintain the BVRC as a high intensity regional center with the co-location of multiple uses in the center, and that would be in support of walkable neighborhoods. And then 2.18 describes guiding principles that encourage residential infill for new construction and redevelopment. And so it's important to note with regard to that policy that it specifically references um, the land uses of regional or general business rather than the mixed use land use on the site um, where um, essentially it equates with the 29th Street Mall. So at the time of the application, as I've noted earlier in December 2018, the city hadn't yet adopted the code changes to increase housing density and reduce non-residential capacity in the BVRC. And so in that regard, it's important to recall that in 2008, the city approved redevelopment for what had been a surface parking lot in the northeast corner of 29th Street for um, the 29 North apartments. There's about 280 units that were built and it's across um, Walnut from the site and at the time the intent was to build apartments through a condition of approval that um, expected um, residential on this site from that 2004 um, site review amendment and the idea was to cluster the density over to this particular site. So then for policies um, 2.37, 408, 409 that are related to environmentally sensitive urban design and energy efficiency the applicants plan to adaptively reuse and repurpose this building rather than demolish it and construct a new one on an infill site is in support of minimizing construction waste and environmentally sensitive urban design. And the intent to add uh, natural daylighting to the structure with vastly improved transparency, new light wells um, for natural daylighting as well as provide a 450 kilowatt photovoltaic panel array on the roof is in support of energy efficiency. So then moving on to key issue number two and consistency with the site review criteria. Among the findings are that the proposed height of the building 
be in general proportion to the height of the existing buildings in the area. And of course, in this context, the two nine north apartments um, are at 55 feet. There's other buildings that measure from a low point of 47 to 47 feet and 51 feet respectively. Um, and then the proposal to add the third story of which equates to about 51 feet um, is considered proportional in this context. And in this case, the existing building steps with the grade and measures 38 feet to the rooftop for both that two story portion that you see on the east side, as well as the single story that you see on the west today. And then there's that distinct mechanical penthouse that's um, 55 feet from the low point. So in comparison to the proposed elevation that illustrates that addition on the western half of the building, you can see that the massing doesn't increase substantially. So that 51 feet, when you measure it from the low point on that east side or the left side of the building, would actually have an apparent height from the street of 32 feet. So the only way you'd have a sense of all three stories was near the stairs to that new lower level, that um, essentially light well that's open to a plaza. So criterion five for the building asks if projects are designed to a human scale through creation of transparency and entrances and activity at the pedestrian level. And as can be seen in the comparison to the building today, the applicant's plans to open up the building with windows and natural light um, does create that transparency and pedestrian engagement that isn't there today. So then similarly on the south uh, plaza side, uh, removing that outdoor escalator and opening up walls and windows and entrances, again, um, this, the pedestrian activity would be greatly enhanced. So then uh, regarding uh, the building design to present a sense of permanence through the use of authentic materials, the applicants proposing glass curtain walls with projecting sunshades and metal panel where new window openings are planned and also proposed is a tapered aluminum panels that are shown in um, somewhat of a dynamic pattern. The plans were found to be consistent with the uh, BBCP design guidelines to have buildings support pedestrian circulation with walkway improvements and usable open space that's integral to the plan. Um, with those plaza improvements and then the parking um, will remain beside the building with vehicular and pedestrian links. Similarly, the uh, plans meet the guidelines to intermingle the building interior and exterior and the plans are shown to remove the large blank walls, provide pedestrian interest as I noted on all sides of the building. And uh, of course, the high quality exterior materials in the building would be made much more energy efficient. And then further, the 29th Street guidelines recommend a style that's appropriate to the time um, with asymmetry, clean and contemporary lines, um, and with materials of the era. So finally, to summarize, staff finds the proposal to be consistent with the policies, the site review criteria, and the relevant guidelines. And with that, staff recommends the following motion. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Hey. Thanks, Elaine, and uh, appreciate you doing that presentation. Before we jump into questions, um, I probably should have done this before your presentation. I'm going to ask planning board if any member has any um, disclosures that they need to make around ex parte communications or um, items that might make it uh, difficult for them to um, rule in, in an impartial manner on this hearing. Are there any disclosures that any planning board member needs to make? Okay, then I'm going to make the, the same one that I've made at, at several planning board meetings. There's a, a large team, a project team. If you, if you look at your printed materials, you can see that there are 11, 12, 11 different um, consulting firms, engineers, architects, and so forth. One of them is JVA. I serve a, uh, a client on a matter uh, that JVA is also working on. I have no uh, contractual relationship with JVA. I don't profit from my relationship with JDA. It's simply a relationship where we are um, both serving the, the same principle. And so I'm making that disclosure. Harman, can you be fair and impartial in reviewing this application today and make your decision solely based on the evidence presented today? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
All right, well then, um, planning board members, this is your opportunity to ask questions of Elaine and any other staff that are here uh, before we move on to the applicant presentation. So uh, go ahead and raise your hand physically if you have a question. Sarah? Uh, thank you, um, Elaine. Thanks so much for that presentation. Um, uh, I have two questions. I'll ask one and then come back around. Uh, in the in the presentation, uh, I might must have been having a, a mild moment of disconnect. Uh, you talked about um, the uh, original plan for this uh, parcel, or well, I'm not sure if this is what I heard that the original uh, an updated plan for the parcel was that it was supposed to be housing. I just got a little confused there. When you were going through the list of how this meets um, Boulder Valley comp plan goals, you talked about um, residential development, really? uh, but you were not pointing to the 29th Street um, apartments, but rather I thought you were talking about this site. So I just wanted a clarification. I'm so sorry to make you go through that again. Not at all. Do you want me to share the screen or do you no, want- No, just, just, just re repeat what you said. I'm so sorry. Yeah, so, so the point is, um, in the comp plan policies, there's only certain policies um, that, or rather land uses that apply to the desire for residential in the BBRC. And it's specific to regional business and general business, not the mixed use business. But I did as an anecdote add the fact that in 2008, the two nine North apartments um, were built in the Northeast corner and that they were in response to a 2004 condition of approval that residential be built in the 29th Street development. That, that particular building um, took essentially residential density um, and essentially built it on that site. So that's my response um, as an anecdote to the desire for residential in this area. Okay. Thank you for, so heard, for repeating yourself. I heard Elaine the same way that you did, and, and it was a little confusing at, at the time. As you know, I know you were trying to get through everything in your 10 minutes, um, and it did sound for a minute like uh, when Elaine referred to that site, she might have meant the site of the, the site review we were having uh, in front of us today. But Elaine, when you said that site was meant to take the residential for the 29th Street development, that site referred to the site of 29 North, correct? That's correct. It had been a surface parking lot and that was earmarked for residential through the 2004 site review amendment. And then it got flushed out in the 2008 site review amendment to build what's there today. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Uh, before I go back to Sarah for her second question, do we have any more questions from planning board, John? Yeah, uh, can you uh, elucidate a little bit on to what degree uh, the planning board has any discretion on the uses within mixed use business? And I'm thinking here of the, of the change from commercial use that is presently at Macy's to office use. To, to what degree does the planning board, is it able to influence that uh, change? Right. So the, uh, the zoning is what controls in this case. And in this case, uh, when the applicant applied in 2018, at the end of 2018, the office and retail were by right uses. And so that's what this is viewed under the lens of is the um, what was established in the code at that time. And um, so um, I don't know if, Hella, if you have anything else to add there about um, weighing in on um, the mixed use business land use with regard to office retail or not. Yeah, in site review, the board really looks at the site design and not the uses that are on a site. And as Elaine just stated, at the time that this application was filed, office use was a by right use, um, regardless of how much office was being proposed on a site. There is some language in the land use um, designation description that talks about housing being encouraged and may in some places be required. 
Um, as you all know, the land use map is part of the Boulder Valley Compound that has really kind of a broader purpose than the code in general. You are looking at it in a regulatory process, but when you do that, you need to keep in mind that the BVCP has, has different purposes and that the standards really have to be specific enough for a landowner to understand what's required to be able to to require certain things under it. So when, when I look at the land use designation, um, it, it's not very specific to tell a landowner on this property, you will have to do residential under certain circumstances. It just says the, the city is gonna encourage it and that it may be required. And, and that's kind of a regulatory um, policy that the city may adopt some zoning that may require housing here under certain circumstances if that makes sense. I think that that policy itself is not specific enough to be used as uh, a trigger to require residential on the site. And so neither is it, uh, is it possible to require, for example, commercial over office use, uh, according to what you said, is, is that correct? Yes, that would be my opinion. Okay, thank you. David? Um, yes, I was um, uh, interested to see that uh, the 7,700 square feet marketplace retail on the south side um, is being um, described by the applicant as um, uh, affordable commercial uh, or affordable um, uh, retail commercial, possibly restaurant, that kind of thing. Um, I just wanted to confirm, Elaine, whether the city had um, has any um, guarantee of that or if that is uh, just a, a, a promise by the applicant to, to do that. Um, so. Well, again, that falls into that category of use, um, mm -hmm. which we're not evaluating right now. So we don't have a means to impose a condition on the use. Um, and um, again, there would be no way to regulate that use per se. Um, Maybe, Hella, you have some thoughts on that as well? Hella, if you can unmute yourself first, that would be great. Sorry, David, could you repeat the question? I was just wondering if, um, you, because uh, I read a, in a couple of places from the applicant that there was um, the intention to make that space uh, at the marketplace on the south, which would uh, be a more commercial restaurant, uh, retail focused. Uh, affordable, uh, but um, I didn't see anything that was uh, guaranteed from a city standpoint. So I just wanted to verify that, in fact, that is more of you know an intention by the applicant, but that, that it's not an enforceable or uh, anything like that. That's yeah, I don't, I don't see a trigger in the code that would allow you to make that a requirement. Thank you, Sarah. Do you want to ask your second question? And actually, I'll just, let me just a half question to follow up on David's question. Um, if the city, if the council passes um, a, um, a uh, requirement under community benefit for affordable commercial space, is it, re would be retroactive to the approval of this building or they would not be required under any new uh, regulation? I think it, to, to guarantee to guarantee the affordability component. So typically, when council uh, uh, adopts those sorts of regulations, they're typically prospective in nature. So they're, you know, designed to affect future projects. Very rarely are they designed are, or adopted to be retroactive. I suppose that that's something that they could consider, um, but typically it's prospective in nature when they adopt new regs. Okay, thank you. And so my my second actual question was, uh, given that this is being transformed into or proposed to transform into office space, given the amount of square footage, how many office jobs would this would this house would this development house? So I'm going to suggest the applicant answer that yeah. question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions from planning board before we go to the applicant presentation? Going once, twice, okay, great. All right, so um, I'm going to uh, give it back to Elaine. 
um, and she'll work with the applicant to get through the applicant's presentation. Um, the applicant has 15 minutes per our rules to make a presentation and then an optional uh, three minutes after public comment if uh, the applicant desires to make any rebuttals. So Elaine, go ahead. Yeah, and in this case, um, the applicant's gonna take controls. And so Jean just needs to um, ask the applicant to unmute and go on to video. I think they're all good to go. Start the video, Charlie. Yeah, how do you do that? At the bottom left. Bottom left, the whole screen, yeah. here we go. Well, hello everyone. Um, I'm Danica Powell, Trestle Strategy Group, and we have a team of us both here socially distanced um, to present to you as well as in New York. So I'm gonna hand it off to Jessica Frazier with Macy's to kick us off. And there'll be four of us speaking tonight. We have requested 15 minutes. I believe that has been confirmed from the chair to 15 minutes to present. Thank you. Go ahead, Jessica. Thanks, Danica. Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Jessica Fraser, and I'm the Director of Development for Macy's. As you all know, we've been a proud member of the Boulder community since we first opened our doors in 1983. We've maintained a consistent presence throughout the years, even during the redevelopment of the former Crossroads Mall into 29th Street in 2004. While we've been proud to anchor the 29th Street Mall for decades, the time has come for us to think about the future. As we've all read in the headlines over the last several years, the retail market is changing and COVID has only accelerated what was already occurring, the closure of many retail doors and their repurposing for new uses. With this changing landscape, Macy's is in a position to think critically about our real estate holdings. And we are pleased to be on the forefront of the retail evolution towards mixed use. That's why back in 2017, we identified our Boulder property as an opportunity to thoughtfully recycle our building. We see no better place than Boulder, a city known for its sustainable, creative, and community-serving philosophy to partner in incubating this concept of adaptively reusing an underutilized big box store. We hope that this project can serve as a model for other their communities to infuse energy into their retail environments while preventing the risk of large outdated anchors sitting empty and idle. We appreciate this opportunity to present the details of this project to you tonight, which will follow our guiding principles as shown on the screen behind me. Um, I don't know that I see our screen up, but anyway, I'm going to pass things over to Eric Compa with Quorum Real Estate Group and he will take you further into the details. Thanks, Jessica. I think I speak for all of us sitting here uh, in Colorado as well in New York that we are very excited uh, to meet with you this evening, albeit virtually. Uh, we sincerely appreciate all the work and the ability to collaborate with staff uh, throughout this entire process. As Jessica mentioned, my name is Eric Campo with Quorum Real Estate Group. Quorum is a 35-year-old Colorado-based development company that focuses on office, industrial, and workforce housing. We've been fortunate enough to serve as Macy's development partner on this project for the past three years. When we first started working on this project in 2017, we spent months and permutated through many, many options until we arrived at what is before you today. An adaptive reuse of a big box store that has no windows and is so inefficient that the lights within the building serve as its primary heat source in the winter months. Now the concept of adaptive reuse is by no means new However, for a project like this, it is the most sustainable approach, yielding something that we believe is transformative and revolutionary. We have a truly unique opportunity to embrace the embodied energy of this building, reinvigorate the north end of 29th Street, and further enhance the vibrant mix of uses within 29th Street. Next slide, please. Again, nope, oh, too fast. Uh, <laughs> Again, the current structure has no windows, but there are other challenges that, the, that with the building and the site that must be taken into consideration, such as the high volume of the store. Next slide. The small footprint of the real estate that is owned by Macy's, all of which, must, all of which is nestled in the context of a larger development. Next slide. The grade break in the middle of the, of the building, such that the western half of the structure is only one level above grade. 
That is what brings us before you tonight. These constraints, amongst others, require creative solutions to revitalize and reuse this building. Next slide, please. At the end of the day, as staff thoroughly discussed, we are requesting a height modification, a move that allows the project to embrace all the constraints and create a, what we believe is a truly fantastic project and hope you agree as well. While it is a formal hot modification to the height of the entire structure, the building as currently designed and as Chris will go th walk you through, will only look as if it's two stories from any adjacent perspective. Thank you. Now I'll hand it over to Danica Powell, who will talk about how we engaged with the community through this process, the results of that community engagement that are included in our uh, project, and then our comp plan analysis. Danica. Thank you, Eric. So as Eric mentioned, we've been working on this project for many years, and we've conducted significant public outreach on this project ranging from meeting with established, established groups such as Better Boulder, Plan Boulder, Boulder Chamber, ULI Boulder, to meeting directly with Mesa Rich, the owner operator of 29th Street, many, many times over the course of this project. We also held an open house on March 5th, right before quarantine hit, and invited all retailers, tenants, and business owners of 29th Street to an open house to view our model and talk about the project. Overall, the input was positive and all were compelled by the creative approach to reusing an outdated department store into an energized anchor for the outdoor mall. The plaza concepts and increased landscaping were all seen as positive outcomes of this project. In addition, we worked with Community Vitality to explore concepts for the affordable commercial retail space and discuss ideas and opportunities for the future. Next slide. So the key community benefits on this project I'll go over quickly. As Elaine mentioned, we're in a very transit rich environment. We have the hot bus directly in front of us and many other modes of transit are available, including on-site car share in the parking garage and on-site B-cycle, nearby Tesla charging station and bus rapid transit at Boulder Junction. The hot bus you can see has a major hub here right in front of Macy's. The significant site improvements that you can see below include the addition of a bike lane and a sidewalk to Walnut Street. Right now, neither of those exist. It's just a road on our side of the street. Our project includes bike parking that exceeds the requirements, bike repair stations, lockers, and showers. The TDM will ensure that employees receive eco passes. Next slide. In terms of the small scale retail marketplace, we hope that this offers Boulder's small business owners and entrepreneurs, makers and crafters, opportunity for an affordable, highly visible location to incubate and grow their small business while also activating the plaza and creating a destination on the north end. We have been working with Community of Vitality to identify options to utilize the space as affordable commercial and catalyze business opportunities for small business owners. This can include proving spaces for startup restaurants and makers to showcase their goods and products while scaling their business in an economic, sustainable manner. And I'm happy to discuss during questions how we may ensure that that continues in the future. Next slide. So the, the plaza we felt was the biggest opportunity for the site to provide significant community for the retailers, shoppers, visitors, and public. Next slide. Currently, the uh, plaza has minimal placemaking and site furnishing. It's often a wide, windy, empty space um, with furniture sliding around. Next slide. So we have worked closely with Mesa Rich, who actually owns the ground underneath uh, of the plaza to transform this barren plaza space into a dynamic, active, safe and flexible space filled with shade, activity, transparency to support the retailers that are both on the plaza and in the mall and create a flow in public space on this end of the outdoor mall. Next slide. In terms of sustainability, the nature of the adaptive reuse drives a sustainable process by recycling many of the building components and materials to ensure that they don't end up in the landfill. In addition, a 300 to 400 kilowatt Solar array will be designed for the rooftop to offset energy use, which significantly exceeds the minimum city requirement. In addition, um, the surgical removal of specific components of the building allow for increased recycling opportunity, reduce trash into the landfill, and reduce transportation costs and carbon impacts. Next slide. Finally, in terms of public benefit, we are really excited for all of the opportunity for public art. This is a very four-sided project with lots of dimensions. We've already talked to Streetwise Wolder about including um, street murals and other local artists to discover where and what types of art will activate the building and plaza. We think the loading docks on the north end of the site present a very compelling space to be creative and activate Walnut. Next slide. 
As Elaine went over in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan, this is in one of the three regional centers, a high intensity regional commercial center that has distinctive opportunities and functions. Next slide. And as she has spent a great deal of time talking about um, planning conformance, we meet significant, significant um, policies in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan, as you can see below. And here's a map showing the land use on the right. I'll pass it on to Chris to talk about the design process and the building itself. Uh, thank you, Danica, and good evening, everyone. Uh, someone certainly has to recognize David's background, which I believe is Macy's in, in uh, Manhattan. Thank you, that's exciting. Um, uh, I'm, uh, as the architect for this project, I'm going to spend a few moments to discuss the design solution. As mentioned before, we are proposing a retail, uh, likely an affordable marketplace use for the south portion of the building, which locates activity on the plaza shown on the right. Next. This is a unique design challenge. The existing building has no windows, no transparency whatsoever. The existing envelope will be removed and replaced with a completely transparent uh, envelope with vertical and horizontal sun shading as illustrated in this west elevation. This transparency contributes to the pedestrian experience. Additionally, uh, there are light wells uh, interior to the floor plate which bring daylight to the deeper areas of the building. Next, half of the building is below grade. Uh, eliminating a bay of the building on the west side and creating a lower level plaza not only helps activate the western edge of the building, but also brings daylight and fresh air into the lower floor. Next, this last floor area will be relocated uh, with a third level rooftop addition with an outdoor terrace uh, facing west with maximum sun shading. Next. We utilize uh, physical models in our design process. Uh, and ordinarily, we would have this model sitting in front of you in the council chambers. Um, short of that, uh, we at least wanted to, uh, to show you the model. Uh, this, by the way, is the model we used in our community outreach uh, meeting. So it was very clear uh, to everyone uh, what we were proposing. Um, and that was, of course, pre-COVID. This view uh, from the Northwest, uh, and next, uh, this view from the Southwest, which communicates the transformation of the existing plaza. The model uh, is lighted to emphasize the building's transparency. And now for some entertainment. Uh, can we run the video with some narration? We're gonna fly around the building. Can you see the video? Yes. Here's the close up of a portion of the building as we begin to fly by. Uh, we have eliminated, uh, and actually, this is a transformation of the building from old to new. We've eliminated a curb cut and enhanced the pedestrian and bicycle experience in the foreground, consistent with Vision Zero. Uh, so it's much safer. As we continue to move around uh, this view from the Northwest. Note the depressed light well uh, and second courtyard. Outdoor spaces for the office users. The second floor is uh, stepped back, resulting in an upper level rooftop terrace. Uh, and then uh, the, tra the Transform South Plaza uh, includes much needed multifunctional shade structures and seating. This finally becomes, finally becomes an active and actually usable public space and with the building a contemporary anchor for the north end of the tw of 29th Street. Uh, note the shift to twilight in the building in the plaza uh, lighting communicating the transparency of the building, a welcome change from the existing condition. So imagine this as a, uh, an appropriate activated reuse of a classic big box. And maybe as important, an, a complimentary public space 
that benefits the entire community. Uh, a genuine contribution to the place that we know of as 29th Street. Jessica? Thanks, Chris. So as you can see, we're very excited to be partnering with the community to deliver a transformational project that I think will serve as a blueprint for retail mixed use centers into the future. Um, as we noted in the beginning, we have a large team here tonight. So our architects, engineers, and consultants are all ready to answer any questions that you may have. Um, thank you all so much for your consideration for this exciting opportunity. Okay, thank you very much to uh, the applicant team there. And before we go on to public comment, we're gonna give planning board members an opportunity to ask questions of the applicant team. I think Sarah had a question uh, that came over from uh, staff questions that has to do with jobs. Sarah, do you wanna ask that question first? Uh, yes, thanks so much. Um, the, given the square footage per office job, how many jobs will, how many jobs be co-located in this building? or up to how many jobs could be co-located in this building? Let Eric from Quorum answer that question. Yeah, so at this point in time, I think it largely depends on the tenant. We don't have a tenant identified. Um, I could see, you know, if it, it largely depends on the ultimate usage and site utilization within the building itself. Well, I know, and it's my understanding in Boulder that we calculate the uh, linkage fee based on the likely number of employees and that's calculated by square footage. If, I think that's correct. So could you tell us please uh, how many employees you calculated to get the linkage fee of whatever was $1.4 million? I think the, well, the linkage fee is like the differential in the square footage and the change in use from retail to office. I think there's a differential uh, fee in that and so office is at one level that's higher than retail and so we took the net differential based upon that square the total square footage of the project which is 153,000 plus or minus of office and 7,000 plus or minus of retail and based our fee on that net change from retail to office on 153,000 does that make sense yes so I'll jump in, Sarah. The way that we the linkage fee is calculated is based on square footage by use. So we don't we don't calculate it based on office users. I don't know if the city has a background calculation that went into that linkage fee calculation, but it's used, it's based on square footage, not number of jobs. To my so you can't no one no one can give an answer to what the uh, the change in jobs from retail to office space would be. Is that is that what I'm hearing? I just want to make sure I'm understanding the, the answer. I think we could probably figure it out, but it's the, the way it's calculated is based on square footage. So we haven't, that's not a calculation we've conducted. I don't know, Elaine, if you have any more insight into how that linkage fee was generated by through the linkage fee study. Yeah, it's it's actually a square footage calculation. And, um, you know, in terms of thinking about it from a code perspective, uh, parking is calculated on a, a 300 square foot um, measure. In other words, it's the same for office as it is for retail. It's one space per 300 square feet. So it doesn't differentiate between retail and office in terms of uh, number of bodies that would be driving, for example. Charles, is there anything else you wanna add with regard to linkage fee? Nope, that captures it. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions from planning board for the applicant? John, you are still. Yeah, uh, you've, you've, in your presentation, you spent some time on both the plaza uh, to the uh, south southern side and the parking that is associated with this to the north. Both of those areas are are not owned by Macy's, so I'm just wondering what sort of formal arrangement Macy's has made with the landowners there, which is uh, Macerich, I guess, uh, 
for the for commitments on the use of that area. Jess, would you like to answer that on behalf of Macy's? Yes, I can do that. Um, so we currently have an agreement between Macy's and Mace Rich, a reciprocal easement agreement that effectively within that agreement covers the use of all the parking. So while we don't own that deck and we don't own that Northern service parking lot, we do have um, perpetual easements over that land to utilize it for parking for our building. It's, it's cross parking for the entire mall. So it's common parking for the entire center. So that won't change with the redevelopment of our project. That agreement will stay consistent. And uh, so does, to what degree, do, let's say Macy's and Mace Rich together decide they want to make a change in either or both of those areas, to what degree does the city have control over what happens in those areas? I can, oh, I can jump in. Um, it's, again, because it's part of a site review, any changes that would impact what's approved today would have to go through some level of a modification analysis, either as a minor mod or as a site review amendment. So the city retains control over what happens in those areas. Correct. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'll just add one more layer that, the, yeah, so the site, the uh, approvals will require that those areas be improved. We've also been working with Mesa Rich, both nationally and locally this whole time to ensure that the improvements we're proposing are in accordance with their mall, you know, standards and what they'd like to see out there. So there's been a lot of coordination between the two organizations, both nationally and locally, to ensure everything we're proposing is something that they would like to see. And there's a lot of discussion around, you know, shade structures and not blocking retail signs and how do we, you know, really support something that's easily maintainable in the future. So there's been a lot of um, discussion on that. And, and you may hear from Mesa Rich tonight on, on what that background has been. Thank you. Lisa? Yeah, I have a question that um, may go more toward the engineers. Uh, and that was just around kind of increasing the permeability, the amount of glass. I really appreciated seeing the solar panels go up. Um, what are you seeing kind of changing in terms of energy efficiency overall for the building? Our rating of materials and so on, how do you see that shifting from what you described as a pretty old style of building um, to a more modern one, but that has a lot more glass in it? going to bring somebody to answer your question. Here's yeah. Matt. <laughs> yeah, my name is Matt with SAR. Um, so <clears throat> we are beholden to the new energy code. And uh, so we are obviously um, increasing the thermal efficiency of the envelope, um, both the high performing glazing and also the R value of the, uh, the exterior wall construction, um, in addition to the solar panels that we'll be adding. So um, we are currently studying the uh, the 2020 uh, City of Boulder Energy Conservation Code uh, with our engineers and uh, um, with the recent change to 2020, we're, we're still diving into that fully, but, uh, but we will be meeting or exceeding it. Great, thank you. And then, and then just to kind of piggyback on that question, um, you know, to the extent that you can educate the planning board if you've done this calculation, by keeping the the bones of the building and saving all of that embodied energy, have you done it, run a calculation as to let's say, you know, to put it in terms everybody could understand, like how many years of annual energy use uh, that will save? Or do you have another metric that we could understand that better by? At this point, I do not. Um, I would have to speak with our uh, energy consultant to get a better answer on that question. Okay, because, you know, we, we talk a lot. It's not important, you know, in terms of the tonight's uh, decision by planning board, but we talk a lot about embodied energy in buildings. And at some point, I'd love to hear an engineer who's done the calcs actually tell me how, you know, how, how many years of light and heat and air conditioning that actually saves so we know whether it's it's, you know, how much it's really worth. So don't expect you to come back with that. But if you happen to get that calc and you want to email it to planning board, that would be cool. Any other uh, planning board members with questions for the applicant? 
David, then Lupita. Okay, um, I was just um, wondering, um, uh, and thank you for the the, uh, the interesting presentation. Um, the uh, uh, sunken area on the west side, as well as the roof deck. Um, I, I wondered if you had any vision of, about whether the public would uh, be able to uh, mingle in some of those places. Um, the, especially the sunken one, I see um, stairways headed down. Uh, so I just wondered if the plan was to, you know, let public use that, or if that was more reserved for the the building tenants. You want to handle that? Sure. Uh, you know, we've got uh, Eric here. Sorry. Um, I know the camera's like moving all over the place. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, we do and see that the current design with the staircases uh, in, in down into the plaza serving as public. One of the careful considerations that we're going to need to discuss with the building department, if we're fortunate enough to get to that aspect, is how we handle ingress egress uh, such that if the office building is closed and somebody needs to egress out for a fire life safety reason. If the building is closed and locked, can they then utilize that plaza? So during normal business operating hours, I would see that being open. However, after hours in a non uh, safe environment, if there's an egress problem, we, the doors would need to be closed and locked. And so that is something we're going to have to figure out and manage in conjunction with the building. department. And the roof deck would be private. Thank you. Lupita. Yes. Um, actually, my question is a little bit of a follow up with David because I was, it was beautiful as you're showing all the glazing and in, in the inside um, lighting. And I was struck of how beautiful that will look in the evening. And so usually office, office buildings emptied after, you know, five or six in the afternoon and therefore uh, I mean in cities where you know past a certain time it looks very empty but the beauty could still be there and I'm wondering if that's been part of the plan how well it will work with the rest of the of the mall uh, to make sure that that is still inviting and in, in, in highlights that that part of the uh, you know of the, of the mall even after the uh, the tenants leave and and that was uh, connected to the question that David made regarding the accessibility to the public of that beautiful area outside. Well, I think for, from my perspective, and then I'll let Chris jump in because I bet he has an opinion on this. Um, <laughs> so the way that uh, the building, given the amount of transparency and glazing, when, it, when, when it, the building is not occupied, and depending on the use, there's always a certain amount of ambient light that needs to be, be maintained for fire life safety reasons and ingress and egress. We could, and I'm certain Chris will come up with a way to make sure that this building has a glow about it. <laughs> part uh, of the reason when it was wanted, not occupied. Part of the um, reason we wanted to show you that nighttime view is, is that I, I, I am always preoccupied with the lighting solutions because I think we don't often think about how a building looks at night. Uh, yes. Certainly not all, all the lights will be left on at night, but there will be uh, lighting that will be uh, for safety for no other reason. But we're going to have an active retail use uh, marketplace uh, and that will be open later. So that will then uh, shed light out onto the plaza. We also have lighting in, in, the, in the structures that we're proposing. In fact, we, have, we will have electrical service there for all kinds of events that might occur and lighting associated with that. So the plaza will always have lighting uh, as well, but it's an extremely good question. Uh, and, it's a, and as we move through this process, we'll keep that in mind. There's also LED strip lighting on the underside of the eyebrow um, overhang over the uh, level three oh, terrace, right. which will be illuminated at night. So thank you for asking that. Thank you for the good answer. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions from planning board before we move on to the public comment? John? Yeah, uh, with respect to the plaza on the south side, is that uh, going to be at all fenced off or enclosed or will it remain unfenced in, in its uh, present uh, situation? I'm just thinking of what happens there after 10 o'clock at night when everything's closed if there's any intention to 
to keep the public from that area? Uh, no, not at all. The plaza is open now and the intention is to keep it open, much like many of the other activated spaces at 29th Street. Like imagine the space between the theater where the um, boxcar um, little bar is and many of the other spaces. So this will always remain open. It will never be fenced off. Thank you. And it will be maintained, um, I think, you know, as a open plaza space in perpetuity. It, it was it was always a plaza space since the 20, 2004. We're just enhancing it um, with, you know, more placemaking. Okay, good news. Any uh, any other members of the planning board with questions? Going once, twice. Okay, I'm going to turn it back over to Jean. Um, Jean, if you would like to manage uh, the public comment period for members of the public who want to address this matter, uh, that would be great. Thanks, Harmon. Um, since we're having difficulty with the raise hand function, um, if anyone would like to speak um, during this public hearing, please message me in the chat. So far I have Lori Call and Boyd Hamilton. So if anyone else is interested in speaking, please um, shoot me a quick message in the chat and um, I'll get you queued up. So with this, um, let's start with Lori. Lori, I've just, um, I think you can unmute yourself. Can you hear me? We can, you can go ahead. I'm Lori Call with the, the Boulder Chamber. Um, on a personal level, I worked at the former Crossroads Mall. So it's fun for me to reflect back on the facility's history as its future is discussed. As the world wrestles with the current economic challenges due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we urge the city to think about how we can support the business community during this trying time. Revitalizing an area like Macy's, a key commercial area in the heart of the city, is an important step in our economic recovery process. The architects have provided a beautiful redevelopment concept, one that would bring energy and life to a very dated building. Our retailers in the 29th Street area are struggling significantly. It is the neighboring office workers that provide those businesses with the activity to operate. And this revitalization of this property is critical to the retail core's function. We've watched retail decline and urge a course correct to this trajectory. The revitalized space would provide employees with opportunities to shop, dine, and socialize. As the city struggles with decreased sales tax revenue, this project could also provide a much needed bright spot to current trends. As more people congregate, we'll see increased purchasing power for existing stores and more energy and excitement in the area. The project also supports other key city goals. Environmental priorities will be addressed by refreshing this old and less efficient building, adding solar and recycling additional building parts, art, Leveraging the talents of local artists will improve the overall space and bring beauty to an area in need of vibrancy. The beautiful outdoor space can support year-round congregating, even more important during our COVID challenges. Landscape improvements will improve the ambiance of the entire neighborhood. Bike lanes and sidewalks will create a safer environment and encourage people to leave their cars behind and visit on bike or foot. And shared parking will create a sense of community and reduce parking needs. The mixed use element of this project will also afford flexibility to meet new opportunities that present and could serve as a space for emerging businesses, nonprofits, or entrepreneurial ventures looking for a smaller footprint. We urge the planning board to support this type of creative redevelopment and the concepts that were outlined. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Okay, next is Boyd Hamilton. Boyd, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, you can go ahead. Great. So thanks for letting me speak. So locally and nationally, the retail environment is both dynamic and rapidly changing, and even more so since the COVID uh, pandemic has hit and we're unsure of what that looks like in the future as you can read in the papers every day. So continual reinvention of landscape is absolutely necessary. The composition of commercial shopping centers as part of this ever-changing retail landscape is migrating towards experience-based 
mixed use 24 hour live, work, play environments. 29th Street is already providing that model through the existing mix of uses, creating a hub for the community to shop, dine, and play. We believe the conversion of the existing Macy's department store into a mixed use building consisting predominantly of office with some additional retail would further enhance and balance the nature of 29th Street as a mixed use community environment in addition to reinvigorating the Northern Plaza immediately adjacent to Macy's. So while we've loved having Macy's as a tenant in the shopping center, notwithstanding, we do believe that the planned conversion to the first class office will have benefits to the center and we look forward to providing a great shopping and restaurants to our new office patrons. So we urge your approval of uh, the Macy's concept. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Boyd. I appreciate that. Okay, next is Lynn Siegel. And Lynn, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Just one word. Nope. N O P E. Boulder's going to find the way it is. We don't need more homes. We've got too much as it is. We have a virus, remember? We, we have a global depression, remember? How many times do I need to say it? Doing is causing my property value to go up and up and up, and I don't want it to go up. I want it to go down, back to where it was normal. This place is growing too fast, too many parking lots, too much transit-oriented development. We don't have a transit system anymore. People won't go on the bus. So what are you talking about here? I don't get it. And of course, the chamber shows up. I'm surprised Plan Boulder sponsored this thing. What the hey? Jobs housing imbalance doesn't need it. 1.1 or whatever that is, Boulder Valley Comp Plan. How many more times do you need to hear? 21st and Pearl, more office, office, office. Office requires people. People require housing. Housing is so high cost that that housing that is also high cost, like across the street at 21st and Pearl, drives up the property values, drives up the demand for affordable housing. And guess what? Then we go to LIHTC funds from federal, but and like the Oz that supplements all of our development, which further destabilizes our community here and diversity. There is none anymore. Maybe you haven't noticed. It's all white. It's all expensive, high, high-end, aspenized. This is another aspenization. We don't need this in Boulder. Macy's is fine with me. I like an old-fashioned department store, or at least one that, you know, if you want to put windows on it, then great. But that's not an excuse to, to have a big, huge development that's going to draw property values up higher and higher, and homeless demands more and more, and people dying on the street, which they will this winter, from homelessness, from all the evictions, from our economy. So what are you doing here? What are you thinking? Hello, it's a global depression. It's the virus, folks. Snap out of it. We're not on a big development spree anymore. It's over, it's done. Smaller is better and it's gonna happen. Not this big, dreamy, lovely mall. No, no, it's not happening. Don't do it. Don't Thank you. Okay, I am seeing no other folks that have um, indicated that they would like to speak. If anyone else would like to, please let me know in the chat.
Okay, Harman, back to you. Okay, thank you, Jean. Um, I'm actually going to turn it back over to Elaine. And uh, Elaine, if if you want to um, work with the applicant in case they have any uh, any additional thoughts in rebuttal that they want to make. Very good. Um, Danica, does your team have anything that you want to add or a rebuttal to anything you've heard or um, additional information? I don't think so. Thank you. Jess, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, just appreciate your all your time tonight. Okay, great. And um, what we're going to do is deliberate at this point. Um, as, as long as uh, planning board's ready to go, I think we can jump straight to deliberation. We've been going at it for about an hour and 25 right now. Uh, does anybody need a break or would like a break before we deliberate? It's fine if you do. Lupita, you want to take five? Okay, so it's uh, 726. Let's come back at um, 7.32. See you then.
All right, so uh, let's jump back in. We're gonna organize our deliberation around a couple of key issues. And the first one is around comp plan compliance. And the second one's around code compliance. And the code compliance is specifically uh, compliance with the site review criteria. So let's uh, talk about key issue one. And um, I think I'm going to start just uh, with a negative poll. So I'm going to flip the question. Um, are there any planning board members who believe that the project on balance does not meet the relevant policies of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan? If so, uh, raise your hand. Sarah. I'm really concerned uh, that it fails to meet 1.10, uh, one one the jobs housing balance. Um, the transition from a retail, which is not to say it's not a beautiful building, but the transition from a, a retail space with a relatively small number of employees to an office with many, 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 many more employees when we already have a, a huge problem with housing seems to me to be a real um, failure to try to advance a key Boulder Valley comp plan goal, like a central focus of the 2015 update. I'm, I'm very, cons I, I really have a problem with it. So, to get some factual background on that, you know, we, we heard the applicants say that because they don't have a tenant, they don't know how many, um, how many jobs are actually going to be housed in the, the proposed use and the proposed building. Um, but do we, do we know how many jobs are in the retail business that's there right now? Well, Harmon, I, I didn't know that it was, um, uh, your responsibility to question my concerns. This is a concern I have. Um, so Sarah, the deliberation, we're allowed to have a conversation. Um, we are, but, but <laughs> uh, it is a three-story office building that is converted from a two-story retail space. Um, so it is a concern of mine uh, that there are going to be Many more jobs, people who make good money, which is awesome. It's wonderful that they're going to be people making good salaries, but we are not building housing at the same rate that we need to be to keep up with this kind of job growth. So my concern is that it does not meet 1.10 trying to address the jobs housing balance. Okay, noted. Any other um, thoughts about that? Does anybody want to respond to Sarah, John? Well, um, I agree with Sarah. I think that this will exacerbate our jobs housing imbalance. And given the, the very important element of housing that we're struggling with now, I find it difficult to think that it's appropriate to move ahead with a, a project that will exacerbate that problem. Any other thoughts? David? Um, the square footage again was around 150,000. Is that right? A hundred and... Yeah, it was, a, it was 153. And actually, yeah. while there's an additional story being put on, it's the square footage that's being removed from the basement and second floor to create the plaza uh, Huckin Plaza that's being moved to the third floor. So the square footage remains the same. So if you, you know, if you calculated 150,000 um, square feet, and I don't know if 300 square feet per job is a, a reasonable number, that would be 500 jobs. Um, you know, if it's, it might be a little lower square footage, depending on how many people you kind of put together in there. So, you know, 500, maybe more. If you, and I don't, I don't know. Um, this is just. I'm just kind of talking since nobody's answered the question. <laughs> just to, so um, people might have in their heads uh, a, an idea of scale. 
uh, and if uh, if we consider that the current uh, Macy's employs, I don't know, 50 people? Yeah, I mean, it could be a, a, a few hundred um, additional jobs, right? Because uh, that you are, when you make, when you have office space, you do make more job intensive use of the square footage, I, I would say. So I just wanted to at least do a back of the envelope on that. Well, then before we move on, can let me ask Jessica, the applicant, Jessica Fraser from Macy's, if she knows uh, the figure on how many jobs are currently or, or have been traditionally in the Macy's. Um, hi, yes, I believe we are in the neighborhood of 85 to 100 or have traditionally been in the neighborhood of 85 to 100 and that's um, full and part-time employees in the building. Okay, thanks for that information. Right. Other thoughts, planning board, Lisa, then Peter. Yeah, I, I take the point and um, I'm not sure that it rises to the same level of concern for me, but I, I think it's a valid concern and I appreciate that it was raised by Sarah and John. Um, it would be nice if we had some estimates, and I know they would only be estimates. Um, one of the things I thought about with this use is having worked retail previously, um, that when you have people working retail shifts, you've got a lot of coming and going and trips being generated because retail shifts tend to be not necessarily a traditional nine to five. Um, and so that was one thing that made me wonder if the intensity might not be quite as much as it might be otherwise. And then this is also pure speculation. Um, but with dedicated office space, I wonder to what extent some of those people may or may not be there all day, every day um, in some of those spaces. Like, again, I don't know for sure what's going to come, but um, I suspect a shift to more remote work or more flex schedules is likely. Um, neither of which I think negates uh, either of your concerns, but it was something I thought about with that. Um, and in a perfect world, I wish that somehow it had been redeveloped with, uh, and, and I don't think the parcel or the building lends itself to it. Um, but resource constraints not considered, I wish there were some townhomes or something in there as well. Um, so yeah, again, I, I don't have the same level of concern, but those are some thoughts I have around that. Peter? Thank you. You know, I also agree with Sarah. It does feel like it's a great time to add housing into this site and then having a balance with the environmental benefit of saving the building and if that would even be possible if it were to be residential or if it would be a complete demolition and then weighing that and then considering the the benefit delivered to the community in terms of the linkage fees and trying to balance all of those items together to determine um, you know, what's ideal if we were to have it and then would that then require the demolition of the site and in terms of the city's carbonization decarbonization goals what are we getting here because we're not demolishing it and at least it's not a demo at least it wasn't residential that we're converting back over to uh, commercials so i hear what sarah's saying and that was my first thought on reading the packet and, and understanding the project i don't know if the applicant or the city can speak to uh, inquiries that they had made or plans that they pursued at any given point around residential. And you, know, you don't need, uh, everyone involved in this project understands what's going on in Boulder. And so for this to have no housing, it, it's not because I didn't know. And so I, I am curious how that decision was arrived at. I mean, this is the buzzsaw that they knew they were walking into and uh, creating more commercial, more office. And if I could, uh, office. sorry. Go ahead, I'm done. May I jump in? Um, one thought about um, the perception of filling that space is that the parking that's calculated and that three, one per 300 square feet assumes not just employees, but also retail customers, of course. So, um, I don't think you can be as concrete as it's this many employees versus this many employees because you have to factor in number of um, shoppers, for example, at the Macy's. And then another um, key point, which uh, Peter brought up with regard to um, the proposal, it's what's in front of us today. And knowing the history of how this was a retail center with anchors on either end 
to create a main street, um, it seems to fit into that context of um, ensuring that there's a, an ongoing anchor to, again, uh, provide a resource for the retailers that are there. Um, so just a couple of perceptions as I hear you talk. Anything else from Charles? I saw you pop on. All right, so I'm going to weigh in and, and I'm just going to say that in my mind um, as to this key issue one, um, the question on comp plan compliance mostly revolves around whether the plan is consistent with the land use map and it is, and the service area map and it is, and then on balance the policies of the Boulder Valley comp plan. And so my take on this is that the key term being on balance um, means that it doesn't have to meet every comp plan goal and policy, just on the balance, it has to meet the aspirations of the comp plan. And I do think that with the facts that we just heard with 85 to 100 employees in the retail, where we know that there's going to be much more density of uh, office employees, there will be a, uh, you know, a negative impact on the jobs housing balance based on this project coming to full completion. I would nonetheless say that with all of the different comp plan policies that this project really uh, complies with beautifully foments um, around adaptive reuse of buildings and environmentally sensitive design. Um, and also the, the point that Elaine just made around better balancing this shopping center where there really needs to be more uh, kind of built-in customers for the coffee shops, the restaurants, and the shops in, in the 29th Street Center um, to enliven the center uh, with people who are actually there all day long. Um, I believe that this project uh, on the balance does meet the policies of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. That's where I stand. Any other comments? John? Yeah, I, I just wanted to pursue a little bit more uh, the the question of an anchor um, and what's what's happening there because i think it is quite central and my understanding of an anchor is uh, an institution that attracts people to the location uh you know in the way that a big department store might or a big grocery store or or something like that what's happening here is we're losing an anchor and it's being replaced by, uh, you know, a, a couple, two, three, four hundred people who work in that area. They might go out and buy a cup of coffee or something during the day or a lunch or something of the sort like that. But it doesn't seem to me that that is a replacement for my understanding of what an anchor really is. Uh, so uh, I have to say that 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 has gone into my consideration as well. David? Um, I, I'll echo um, a lot of the things that Harmon uh, brought up. Um, I also think that um, that on balance, uh, it, 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 this proposal does um, a very good job of, uh, of meeting the, our com a comprehensive plan um, principles. I do want to add also that uh, the BV BVRC is um, you know, incorporated into the comprehensive plan as uh, additional, um, has, has additional kinds of, of, of things to consider. And, and this is our commercial center. Um, and uh, as a result, um, I, I, I see the value of increasing the commercial uh, activity uh, that can uh, keep the vibrancy of this, uh, of this op um, really, fresh and, and, and economically viable. Uh, the, additional, uh, the additional people that will be uh, working in this space and, and using those businesses I think is great. And I think that just really the BV, BVRC uh, aspect of it added on to uh, all the other uh, uh, comp plan principles I think uh, is, makes me feel uh, pretty, pretty comfortable with this proposal. Um, I do realize that we, we do look for housing uh, opportunities. Uh, we will be getting uh, impact fees that will 
will help economically with with this uh, impact. But um, I guess on every every occasion, uh, I can't expect to see uh, housing where it just may not uh, fit well on the site, given given all the other things going on here. So uh, I'm I'm pretty much. Uh, Leaning in favor of, uh, of of saying that it's 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 fine on key issue one. Any other thoughts on comp plan compliance, Alisa? Um, just kind of to go off of what David just said, I remember this. So I remember the old Crossroads Mall. I tried to put the old food court up. Um, <laughs> And um, back when I was on Bureau, actually, while I was interviewing for Bureau, um, I, I remember talking about just the, the sheer volume of surface parking lots that were going in, the lack of housing on the site, um, the prominence given to cars in a certain section, and just that I was disappointed in kind of the direction it had gone. Um, I share, I think, David's take and in some way Har Harmon's take on this particular parcel on the overall site. Um, when I pop up to a 10,000 foot level, and I look at this entire um, shopping center, I would love to see more housing, um, but in terms of adaptive reuse, in terms of the environmental hit, in terms of just where it's located on the site, I don't have as strong of a feeling about having to have housing there, um, but I would really love if over time, particularly if we, at some point, the value is high enough that we can lose some service parking lots, um, I would love to be, see housing brought in also on this parcel, and I wish it had been there from day one. Uh, with the redevelopment. So I'm also leaning toward on balance, uh, feeling that it, it does meet uh, the criteria and is a good fit, but that doesn't mean I don't want housing. I saw Lupita trying to jump in. Yeah, I, I also am torn with this because I, like I said, I think um, the way this project is envisioned, um, it really looks as a probably uh, invigorating that area of our city. And I also am torn with the fact that, you know, uh, Macy might have been a very last legitimate, you know, uh, departmental store in the city. Uh, and so, but reality is things are changing and these sort of stores are disappearing around the country. So it is just a lot of things happening. Um, I am also very worried about the situation with our housing, which, you know, it appears that we keep getting projects where we're really not making a whole lot of um, increases in our in our housing situation. And so um, just like Lisa mentioned, if there was some um, ways to look at improving the housing opportunities in this would be great, maybe not presently, but certainly in the future. I, I don't know how to how to mention that so that it be that an, op an, an option somehow, because I really think that we need to start being a little bit more forceful in, in our you know, stated co uh, commitment to improving housing in this, in this town. We, we're just not doing well enough to really show our commitment. So you know, it, it's just a difficult situation all around. So that's kind of like my two cents. Thank you, John. Yeah, uh, I mean, with respect to housing, it, it's we haven't heard anything from the client, or I mean, from the applicant, uh, about why they decided not to include housing. Say, I don't know, on the top floor or on the, you know, east side or something like that. Uh, we're all assuming that that's an inappropriate place for housing, and and giving the applicant a a free pass on that without having heard the logic behind their decision not to include any. So I'd be interested in that. Yeah, well, let's give the applicant a chance to weigh in on that. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. Um, so I, I'll start. The, the zoning is a key issue that drives housing development in the community. So in this um, particular area, the zoning is BR1. Which, only, which requires 1,600 square feet of open area per unit. So on this site, you could do 64 units. Those would be 64, 2,500 to 3,000 square foot units, luxury condo units. So, and you cannot adaptively reuse the building into residential, nor do 64 units make sense. So you ask, you know, in the future, what can be done? Looking at the zoning is a, a great indicator of how to 
think about residential development in the community. Um, I'll let Eric answer the yeah, I think other the, part of the, the question. The constraint that we're defined is, is the, the site of which Macy's owns, which is the footprint of the store. Uh, Elaine uh, brought up earlier that the density within the original 2004 site plan approval, which was 29th Street Mall wide, transferred the density of any residential housing on that site plan approval to the 29, what is now known as 29 North. So that as a function of that approval is where the residential density went. And as we studied the zoning of the site to which we, Macy's controls, which is uh, 75,000, 100,000 square feet, that's how we arrive at the open space per unit, the number of units is, which is driven by the open space, which is 64 units because of just how small our site is in the context of the broader mall. I hope that's helpful. So we, to answer your question, we certainly evaluated it and looked at it in depth. Thank you. Okay. Any more thoughts? Any other planning board member thoughts? Sarah? You want to unmute Sarah? Um, I'd love to ask a question of the applicant. That's just a follow up to what to their uh, most recent response. Um, if this had been submitted after the new ordinance for the opportunity zone, would that have changed um, what you might have brought f uh, forward? Uh, no, we started studying this building and, and arrived at the conclusion of adaptively reusing the structure in 2017, well before the opportunity, we were even made aware of it. And it made, had no bearing on the decision of what's before you today. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Well, any other, any other uh, planning board questions or comments, I should say? More deliberation, David? Yeah, I'll just make a comment. Uh, I, I think that that was an insightful uh, observation about the residential development potential in BR1. Uh, well, actually, we're talking about MU, but, um, but we just went through an exercise in use table uh, standards, uh, and, and we were not allowed to really delve into the intensity standards. And, uh, and there, there are moments like this where I think that uh, it'll be nice to get that project completed, but the intensity standards may be um, still in need of some, uh, uh, some looking at uh, to see if, if we're uh, still discouraging uh, mixed use residential if we if our minimum lot area or minimum open space area in some of these re, um, zones is too high we may be making it difficult to to get some second floor uh, uh, small units as a uh, part of these kinds of proposals so that's not anything to do with this particular site review but I just want to make that observation um, and then I'll also just um, say that I would I, I really uh, I know that this isn't an official thing, but uh, making marketplace that marketplace area retail affordable to some um, to some uh, retailers that could it, that could just really uh, make this a wonderful space uh, to have a, a row of kind of interesting uh, businesses that maybe couldn't afford to to be there if the, if that weren't kept affordable for them. So I don't know if the applicant has thought about, you know, guaranteeing in any way that that will be done, but I, I do think that that would, um, that would be a great thing to have in that space. And if if no, I could just I, add on. Hold on a sec, Sarah. So David, as you do your, your use table work, you know, one of the really interesting things about the, uh, the use table uh, work that I like is this new L uh, designation where, you know, you put a little L in the box and there's a special limitation. And I think you point out a really, really great opportunity. I think I've already reserved L18 for the criteria for, uh, for residential in uh, industrial zones. Um, so, so if you're gonna give me that, how about L19 where for mixed use residential in commercial buildings like this, um, the open space per unit uh, intensity standard is different uh, to respect the fact that in a lot of these commercial sites with short setbacks, there's a real constrained amount 
of open space. So now I'm going to put a little stake in the dirt for L19 to change the uh, open space requirement on mixed use. Sarah. Well, hopefully Charles is taking notes on the L's. Um, to David's point about the permanent, the affordable business space, uh, 5.06 in the Boulder Valley Comp Plan speaks specifically to affordable business space and a diverse employment base. So it would be lovely if perhaps as a, uh, maybe it's not a condition of approval, but maybe a, a motion to city council to think about how um, they might discuss with the applicants um, making this a permanent affordable uh, space for small businesses. I'm not sure what the tools would be for the tool would be for that, but David. Oh, I, I actually I think it would um, have to be um, just conversation with staff at this point, right? Unless city okay. council decided to call it up on that basis. So, you know, I would say, you know, I, I'm willing to recommend that. Maybe we can consider a motion, but I, I think it's yeah. All right. It doesn't need to be a motion. Whatever would be the right way for it to be a conversation. Great. So, um, any other thoughts on this first key issue? That was that was going to be my comment regarding, in lieu of not being able to do housing, I think affordable business space will be very very good, uh, and maybe even looking at some sort of percentage is really encouraging because you know there there's also need for that, and that will promote growth in our city, hopefully for people who are already here and they need spaces to start their businesses here. Okay. So I, I'm just gonna react to say that I'm, I'm concerned that there's really no, uh, I, I don't see necessarily the, the legal hook that we can use to require that. Uh, the fact that the applicant's offering it and it's in the staff report and it's in their presentation materials um, gives us some leverage and, and I'd be, happy with without adding a motion um, to require it. I'm, I'm not seeing the way that we can require it. Um, and then I'll just say as a, sort of a wrap up, um, for me at least, the, uh, the ITE manual shows that department store creates 3,458 daily trips, while the office um, space is uh, 1,916 trips, including the retail being proposed. So it's a net a decrease in daily trips of over 1,500 trips. It almost cuts the, the vehicle trips in half. And again, this is really why we have to look at comp plan compliance on balance because we're gaining a lot in terms of decongesting our roads, taking people out of single family vehicle car trips, and we're losing something when it, when it comes to job housing balance. But as David said, you know, other housing projects will come before us. And as Elaine said, this is the project that's before us now. And as the applicants said, the best they could do is to tear down the building, which loses us all of those environmental benefits of embodied energy and gets us 64 luxury condos that really don't help the job housing balance at all. They just create multi-million dollar condos. And on top of that, if there are 64 at 9.54 vehicle trips per condo, which is what the IT manual says for residential, we're looking at 6,000 trips, which is twice as many as the Macy's created and four times as many as the current proposal. So that's the kind of balancing act that I'm looking at. Um, and I do think that the application meets the, um, the comp plan goals on balance. Shall we move on to the second key issue or do we have any more thoughts on the first? I would just jump in and follow up on John's point of the anchor and if the anchor really is important I think this is the closest to an anchor we could get because we're not going to change the economics of the world on retail and wave a magic wand I'm not saying you're saying that but and have a, a, a big box retail store again probably so the idea that there is a strip of retail there and the plaza activation will at least provide some bookending and activation of that plaza in a way that could approximate, you know, what a really lively anchor would be in, in the go-go days of the 50s when everyone had to have a go out shopping after the war. I thanks. I, I do understand the the present retail situation, but I just wanted to point out uh, when the discussion of an anchor was taking earlier. I'm glad you did because it needed to be said. 
Any others or move on to key issue two? Okay, then we're gonna move on to key issue two. Does the project with its proposed modifications to the land use code meet the site review criteria? And specifically, there are two uh, modifications to the land use code that are being requested. And one is, is to increase the height of the building from 38 existing to 51 feet where 35 is the maximum principal building height. And the other is around the trellises um, south of the site atop the existing underground parking. So that's the plaza, um, which are uh, 34 feet, 15 feet measured from the finished grade, however where 20 feet is the maximum accessory building height permitted in the zoning district. So uh, I'll do this as a negative poll to start with. Is there anyone who feels that the project uh, and its modifications don't meet the site review criteria? Would anybody like to speak in favor of the project meeting the site review criteria for the record, David? And then John? Yeah, I feel pretty strongly that this is, um... A, a very uh, appropriate uh, height uh, for this uh, building. Um, I think that uh, it, it, it uh, is an example of why we should have a little bit of flexibility because there's topology, there's, uh, uh, but the visual, the visual is going to be quite, um, quite decent uh, uh, and very much in, uh, very much compatible with other um, types of, of, of height um, forms that we see in that area. Uh, so, um, so I think it, it's quite good. And then um, uh, also the, uh, with the um, shelters, uh, I, I, I don't see any issue with that at all either. So, um, so I'm uh, with those two, um, absolutely. And I don't see any other, um, any other concerns in the site review criteria checklist. John? Yeah, I, I agree with David. I think this is very attractive, much a, a huge improvement over what's there now. And, uh, and I congratulate the, the applicant and the architect for coming up with something that looks so nice. Uh, I, think, I think it is a, a good improvement. Other thoughts? Lupita? Well, Peter brought up uh, the malls are the 50s, but I'm actually, um, I'm a valley girl from LA going to the mall in the 90s was a thing to do uh, and I'm wondering if in the future this site as beautiful as it appears right now could be some sort of point of reu reunion for young people so this is something for the city to consider but also as uh, the applicant moves forward with you know all the details of the of the building think about you know how could this add additional benefits Lupita, you froze. Can can you maybe uh, take off your video and see if we can hear you speak? Hmm. Lupita, if you can hear me. Um, that they have to face. Oh, there you go. Lupita, 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 we missed you for about a minute. Oh. We missed you for about a minute. You were talking about a place of reunion when it cut out. Oh, so I was saying that, you know, this as, uh, is a, it's a beautiful proposal in terms of the building and the p possibility of having this as a focus point for young people. Uh, I would like the, to encourage the applicant and also from the city side to see what additional possibilities we can have to give this as a specific place for young people to, you know, to enjoy themselves given, you know, all the challenges that they, this generation has to deal with. Thank you. Other thoughts around site plan review criteria and compliance there too, or lack thereof. Okay, uh, I'll entertain a motion. Is there a motion maker? David, mate, you got to make it with the. I've got to make it with off. mute off. There um, you go. There we I go. I thought you were singing the theme song to Motion Maker, the hit musical starring David Ensign. <laughs> <laughs> it's just one of those um, 
uh, balloon parade uh, moments in front of Macy's. Um, motion to, uh, I would like to make a motion to approve site review case number LUR 2018-00075, incorporating the staff memorandum and the attached site review criteria checklist as findings of fact and subject to the conditions of approval recommended in the staff memorandum. A second? I'll second it. Okay, so um, is there any discussion to the motion? Okay, then I will make that the motion of the planning board. Planning board moves to approve site review amendment case number LUR 2018-0075 incorporating the staff memorandum and the attached criteria checklist as findings of fact and subject to the recommended conditions of approval. Do a roll call vote. Um, starting with David. David? Aye. John? Nay. Sarah? I'm also going to vote no, and I'd really like my no vote to reflect that it's not about the building, but the importance of highlighting the jobs housing imbalance and that we've got to reprioritize that. Lupita? I'm torn on this one because I really am uh, thinking about the housing that's so important, so I'm going to go nay. Lisa? Aye. Peter? Aye. And I'll vote aye. So the motion passes four to three. Okay. Thank you. Congratulations to the applicant. That closes this public hearing. Okay. Um, we'll move on to matters from the planning board. Does any planning board member have any matters to go over? Okay, then matters from the planning director. Is there anything from staff? Nothing from staff. Cindy, I don't know if you have anything for the board. Thanks, Cindy. I just, I just wanted to touch on something really quickly that uh, a member of the public um, mentioned. Um, I just wanted to assure the board that the rules of decorum that we go over at the beginning of the meeting, they are on the website. Um, they've been up there from the beginning and um, also that um, we do have to go over those at the beginning of each meeting. It is required. Um, so just wanted to kind of let everyone know that that is something that we do have to do um, and they are there for everyone. So just wanted to let you know. Thanks, Cindy. And also our next meeting, October 1st, has been canceled. So we aren't got two weeks off. Awesome. Sarah? So I just want to say, Harmon, that you are doing an awesome job. And I know that sometimes I snap, but um, you are really doing an amazing job in a very difficult uh, circumstance. And I just want to make sure that I convey that to you and thank you for that. Sarah, I really appreciate that. And especially in public, thank you very much. I, I really think this is a great board. And, and when we were um, in, our, uh, in our breakout session during the retreat, and we talked about how um, we could develop trust with each other by disagreeing in a thoughtful manner and that, you know, John had asked the question about uh, whether unanimous voting would make, uh, make it more trusting an environment for planning board members. And I talked to John about, uh, and, and you, about how we had had certain, uh, some motions that were crafted so that we could get a unanimous vote and that that also creates a lot of trust when you can work out a motion where everybody agrees and we get a seven nothing and it's kind of like everybody's equally pissed off, um, which is what happened with Appendix J where half the board wanted to abolish it and half the board wanted three years and we ended up at 18 months and a 7-0 vote to commit that to, to city council. That created trust in the previous planning board. And, and then there's also additional trust that we can create among ourselves through thoughtful disagreement. and. Um, and so, you know, it can go both ways and, and in both ways can create more trust and it's building a team. So thank you very much for, uh, for saying that. David? If I may add, because I think, you First, know, today's yeah. quote has something to do with that. You know, the fact that I, I know that that not just three of us were torn with the idea that we, we do have high needs and we are here to support the city. And it's, in always, it's not always an easy solution. 
And I, I think something like this, it, it should be reflective of the fact that we do have the city in mind. And some of us sometimes go slightly one way or another. I feel really good about this because I also felt very positive about the project. But I also feel very strongly about how we really need to focus on, on, on and hoping that we'll have more and more opportunities for increasing our housing. So I think it's reflective. And so it makes me feel good, like you said, that we're all kind of on the same place and I feel comfortable that even a vote like this really reflects that what we are trying to do really is in the best interest of our city. Thank you very much for everybody. David, you were gonna say something too? Sure, I wanted to um, just uh, build up on what Cindy was saying. Um, I, I wanna really um, commend the city for all the support that we've been getting for using the Zoom platform. Um, it's really, it, it's weird when the hand raising function doesn't come up and, and there are um, weirdnesses with software that you don't always know why. Uh, and other and various individuals may actually not have installed the very latest version of Zoom, so it may not even be anything that the city can control. So there, there's been a lot of work, um, and we we really do need to get um, that uh, check in at the beginning of each meeting to know what the rules of engagement are. And I also want to say earlier today at 10 o'clock, the city gave an emergency update to the community on COVID because of what's going on at CU. And that um, the same people that support that are supporting this meeting. So this is a lot of intense uh, effort that goes into this. So uh, thank you, Jean. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Ryan, who I'm sure was involved in Brenda. Uh, all these folks who really work hard to put this together for us. It's a, a, a lot of stuff has been going very smoothly during COVID because of all that work. Um, good. Thank you. And part of giving a, that decorum thing at the beginning is we have a lot of people that join this meeting that have never joined the meeting before. So, you know, so we don't have the, the same people every meeting. So we have to do this each time. So, but thank you for that. Sarah. I just want, I want to uh, reinforce what David said and also to put the question on the table for future discussion about the possibility. And I think I hope will will become a reality that even when we're back meeting in person, that an online uh, access for um, those who cannot actually get to uh, leave their house in, at night because they have kids or whatever uh, can still participate in our hearings. And if we can think about how to do a hybrid model uh, going, you know, once we're back in person, I think that would do a lot for um, accessibility. And I realize it's a lot more work, but if we can think, really put that uh, on the agenda for thinking through how we might do that, I think it would be helpful. It's It's been talked about for sure. Okay, I good. Mean, I realize that we've kind of crossed a threshold now with all of this and um, the new normal, we don't know what that's gonna be, but it probably will involve this. I can't, don't quote me, <laughs> don't write it in stone, but something's gonna happen. Yeah. Cindy promised us remote meeting. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and I'll, I'll just uh, add on to that kind of um, for board members as well, uh, kind of like, you know, that you can have a certain number of absences or something like that. Or um, I've been watching the state legislature as well. And there are people early on who are on immunosuppressant drugs because they are cancer survivors or currently fighting cancer or legislators who have newborns, um, you know, in situations like that. And I, I think especially for the board that there is um, an argument to be made for the vast majority of the time people being present physically in the same room. Um, but it might be nice moving forward to have some kind of request based or special circumstance thing where from time to time somebody might be able to um, remote in even if they're part of city council or part of a board, um, you know, if circumstances warrant it. Because it's a shame to have someone not be able to plug in just because it's not physically safe for them to be in a room or because they have a childcare situation or whatever, you know, and I, I wouldn't want that to be the norm every day. Um, but if it happened a couple of times a year, maybe it's not such a big deal. So I'll just yeah. put a plug in for that too, for the powers that be. Great. And Thank I you. just want to make a comment, Cindy. I just mentioned how well these meetings are run by city officials. Um, as I'm coordinating meetings for my own my scientific community is having our annual conference and we had to move online and I have to hold meetings for a committee that I'm in charge of. 
and I'm doing tutorials. So all of these things, knowing how things can work well, really helps me. And even in all the capacities that I have to be in. So I just want to shout out to you guys that in fact, you are a good example how to make it work so thank you very much oh, for everything good. you do oh that's great yeah i just liked it this morning <laughs> well good <laughs> right. well that's always nice i'm gonna bounce over to hella any uh matters from the city attorney no matters for me okay and um so we, we didn't really, we kind of debriefed a little bit from the meeting, but that's our next matter. So if, if anybody wants a deeper debrief, uh, here's your opportunity. Nope, John? You did a nice job chairing, so I appreciate it. Thanks, John. Uh, I, I thought it was a, uh, uh, I thought we stuck to the, the site review criteria and, and the discussion was really, really solid tonight. And we gave we gave a project of this size its proper shrift, so, um, and a four three vote pretty uh, pretty unusual but um, good to see. I guess I think it's reflective of the fact that it's a good project, but also that we have conflicting needs in the city, and we really we don't have perfect projects unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But I, I I would like to for the applicants to know that you know what they brought is, is 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 valuable and also realizing that we are in changing times so even like i said uh what used to be um the image of in this case a mall is shifting right before our very eyes so we really are dealing with a lot of unknowns and hopefully setting the pace for a for something new and great we just don't know exactly how that is but we finding some of these pieces. So that's my comment. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to say on the debrief side that I really appreciated, uh, you know, votes on both sides and hearing in detail, you know, what the problems were. And I hope that I accurately conveyed that I have some of those same concerns. And at the end of the day, you have to kind of fall down on one side or the other and you go where you go. Um, but that I, yeah, I, I think it was all valid. I, you know, I, I could, I could pick up either side and argue for it. And at the end of the day, you have to pick one, but um, I think it'll be interesting to see what other projects come forward. I wish it's not what we're doing right now. I wish we could redevelop the whole parcel, not entirely, but I wish we could look at the whole thing. You know, the, the other thing I, I think I'd add is that the, the, the split vote sends a message, right, to the next project applicant. And it also, you know, highlights some of the constraints that this applicant was faced with that made them make the choice that they made that, you know, despite the fact that it does, you know, it increase the problem of the jobs housing imbalance was the only um, really sensible way forward for them to go um, under the zoning code. So it makes us think about the zoning code too. So it, it gets, that split vote gets people on the city side thinking, gets people on the applicant side thinking, gets us thinking on planning board. So there's a value to, to you know, not just getting in line in these votes. Sarah? I, I would agree with that, and I think it points to, uh, to do a little um, rah rahing for the use table project. I think it points to the interesting ideas around um, revitalizing our, our neighborhood centers to being um, a different kind of mixed use, uh, uh, not the kind of high intensity that is at, in our BVRCs, but rather more sort of hum neighborhood scale. Uh, denser urban in a I, I think urban form is the term we use but is not exactly what I mean because I, it's not at the level of what um, is just got approved but I do think that we have some incredible opportunities with those neighborhood centers which also then gets us to the importance of the um, sub community planning process um, because those neighborhood centers conceivably will be at the center of sub communities Oh, um, thanks. Um, if you don't mind, Herman, I'll just add on to what, what Sarah just said. Yeah, I, I totally agree that, with that. I think it, it does uh, help us to think about our, our string of pearls. I, I also think that, um, you know, just 
a place that my mind goes all the time, the longer you've been on planning board, the more you see how um, market rate, uh, market rate uh, properties in Boulder end up being quite expensive. And I would challenge us over the next uh, months and years on the planning board to, uh, to consider, you know, we have our affordable housing levers. We, we have what we have been able to put together uh, and, and we know that, the, that those help us uh, get towards the 20% the affordable housing goal. But um, what other levers are, might we be missing uh, so that we don't always have to explain to our friends how on planning board we approve things where rents are $2,000 for this little apartment. <laughs> and, uh, but, but, and we have to go by criteria, but um, maybe there's, uh, there might be some stuff out there. So I just I want us to get thinking about that because I think it's something that we all share. We would all like to see uh, more uh, opportunities for, for a diverse set of population to be living in here in Boulder. Indeed. Other thoughts in debrief? Okay, great job tonight, everyone. Um, nice meeting. And uh, Cindy, you already touched on calendar check with the cancellation of October 1st. We'll see each other again on the 15th. So that's like a three week break. Have a nice mini fall vacation. Um, are there any calendar check items that come from planning board, m meetings you might miss, um, concerns about dates? Okay. Um, Lupita, I'm planning to attend the next Landmarks Board meeting. Is that good and what you were expecting? Yes. Okay. Yes. I'm going to be in a conference for the next two weeks now. <laughs> Instead of being one week for my conference, that is stretching into two. Oh, goodness. Uh, they, they're not having the long meetings. Now. Everything on Zoom is like you have to be reduced because otherwise you are go berserk. Totally. Cool. I'll be at the Thank next you. Then you both will be at the next Landmarks Board meeting because that's October 22nd and it's a joint meeting with us. So we, in that meeting, are we, do we have a project that we will be voting on or is it, is there some concept thing that we're talking about with Landmarks? Yes, yep. it's the uh, redevelopment of portions of the first Presbyterian church and the little annex site um that's out there as well so yeah plans will be sent out in advance of the okay. okay if there are no other calendar check items i'm gonna adjourn the meeting yeah okay the meeting's adjourned good night everybody good night. thanks good night. Jean. thanks cindy thanks, Jean. thanks yep. everybody enjoy the break thank you the nuggets are paying <laughs> thanks jane